When did we first come to believe in human transcendence through the power of birds? Global anthropologic surveys of hunter-gatherers and mythology from classical literature widely record feathered beings representing and assisting spiritual leaders, deities, and shamanic practitioners. These feathered beings are typically associated with named individuals or positions of religious authority who use the abilities of birds to mediate other dimensions either above or below. Humans frequently interact with the feathered beings or anthropomorphic deities in sacred narratives, memorializing mythological events. Ceremonial practices and the sacred narratives of feathered beings appear worldwide where they're not represented in rock art. This suggests the concept of birds aiding humans emerged before rock art was integral to mediating the real and imaginary deep in prehistory. Before proceeding further, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present Feathered Beans in Ice Age Art at this year's European Association of Archaeologists Annual Meeting. My name is Bernie Taylor, and my research explores a deep route to mankind's creative capacity by looking at how we came to view our cosmos through the study of Upper Paleolithic cave art. In this presentation, we will journey back in time to the earliest known depicted feathered and beaked projections of humans to better understand how animals have helped us to mediate the real and imaginary. We resume our journey at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, where an avianoid can be found on the so-called Pillar 43, or Vulture Stone at about 11,000 years ago. Note, vultures do not have round heads. Eagles do not either. We are looking at the representation of human wearing a raptor mask. The character is an avianoid. We now travel back a few thousand years earlier to La Pasiega in Monte El Castillo of Cantabria, Spain. What first caught my eye was the formation marked with the green arrow. That was the appearance of an eagle's or vulture's feathers. I believe the Ice Age artist would have noticed the same. The inset inscription in red ochre is the more common view of La Pasiega. Guidelines for reading the La Pasiega inscription may be found in my 2021 Prehistoria paper, Lunar Timekeeping in Upper Paleolithic Cave Art, which can be downloaded from academia.edu and ResearchGate. I propose the syntax is the same as the grids in the French cave of Lascaux. This de-stretch view of the La Pasiega shows there is more red ochre on the panel, as marked by the green arrows. Some of the red reveals a golden eagle feeding a yellow slug to her eaglets. Components of the scene can be more closely examined at another time. All of these presented images are available on my YouTube, academia.edu, and ResearchGate sites. A closer look at the yellow slug the white material at its midsection may be datable. Both the timing of the yellow slug and eaglets suggest an early summer scene. The La Pasiega scene is a close replica of geological pareidolia on Pico del Cornon in Asturias, Spain. P1 was the visual perspective position of the artist. We can look at these scenes astronomically with the aid of Starry Night Pro 8. Minutes before dawn, 13,000 years ago, on the astronomical path of the eagle, Aquila, she flew just above the visual horizon to meet with Pico del Cornon and feed the hungry eaglets. There she met the dawn in a transcendental moment. Note how the orientation of a constellation to the horizon changes over time and in different locations. This pictorial relationship is not likely to be by chance. The ancient Greeks had obviously inherited some of their constellations from the Upper Paleolithic. More cave underworld, terrestrial, and skyworld examples can be found in my 2023 UISPP presentation titled The Archaeometry of Space, which can be viewed on YouTube and downloaded from my academia.edu and ResearchGate sites. Returning to La Pasiega, the feather-like feature outside the actual image as indicated by the green arrow, does not appear to be a pictorial component of the panel. My wider interpretation of the chamber is that via mediating through this feather-like formation, the teacher or apprentice became the mother eagle who flied into the underworld, terrestrial and stellar planes. We travel deeper in time to the French cave of Lascaux at about 17,000 years ago. 
Here we find an avianoid in profile wearing a beak and with feathered fingers in the so-called shaft of the dead man. The avianoid is flanked by a head-down bison, which appears to be dropping her calf, a sitting bird, and a spraying rhino. The bison has previously been described as wounded. We can see the resemblance to an actual birthing bison on the YouTube video. The sexes and life history stages of animals are often misinterpretations in the study of Upper Paleolithic cave art. The orientation of the sitting bird, as well as the feet of the man and hooves of the bison, establish the horizontal plane. The birdman is at a similar angle to supergiant bright stars, Rigel and Betelgeuse, in the Paradolia constellation Orion. This was the view just before dawn on the visual horizon in the season when bison dropped their calves. The artist depicted the birdman in profile, and thus we do not see more stars usually identified in the body of Orion. The horns of Taurus in the bison overlook him. The cave below, the terrestrial plane, and the above in the sky world are the same. The avianoid mediates between those planes. I'm not aware of any geological terrestrial elements for this panel. We can compare the night sky at the Lascaux location 17,000, 15,000, and 13,000 years ago on the visual horizon a few moments before dawn. Note how people in the Lascaux region's view of Orion over millenniums dropped below the horizon due to precession. Skywatchers who later entered the cave in their own time may have developed a myth to explain Orion's apparent locational shift. The rhino may not be an element in the scene. We may find more examples of birds mediating the real and imaginary in other Upper Paleolithic caves, such as the Agnes Day panel in the French Grotte des Pères non pères from an earlier period. Note the agitated mare looking over her back. Picasso appears to have borrowed his Guernica horse from the Grotte des Pères non pères I'm being generous with the word borrowing. The Spanish artist had an interesting twist on this perspective. In his own words, I would rather copy others than repeat myself. In that way, I should at least be giving them something new. We can compare an expanded view of the original panel to my outlined masked avianoid character who integrates with the horse. The mask is most representative of a griffin vulture. Note how the beak and headdress are worked with natural lines. Less obvious are the rump and the right rear leg of the horse, which have the appearance of a plunge diving turn. Ten years ago, when first encountering this animistic motif, my logical self asked if this was a direction toward or away from science. Here we are today at the world's largest archaeology conference in a session about animals mediating the real and imaginary. Picasso went there as well, borrowing the concept of his upper paleolithic avianoid for his 1936 painting, Curtain Design for Roman Rollins Play, Lay 14 Juliet. The anthropomorphic characters set the stage for a journey into the supernatural. Note the long beak, strong breast, large fingers, and odd feet on both avianoid characters. We can find evidence of the avianoid among earlier dated art at the Upper Paleolithic Cave of El Castillo on the northern Iberian Peninsula where on the 10-meter across panel called the Gallery of Discs, there are more than 80 red discs that are on average about the size of the palm of your hand. One disc among them has been dated to at least 34,000 years old. On this panel, we find a teacher and apprentice. Note the wide, interested eyes of the apprentice and how the teacher speaks into his ear. Also listening in on the shoulder of the teacher is a golden eagle, which stands at about a foot tall. This is roughly a mid to late June time period for the young eagle. The artist is designating a time and place. There is also this masked cosmic man, avianoid, whose left leg and right arm are raised. The right hand holds what appears to be an egg. His left arm has a feathered texture. D-stretch reveals that the mask of the cosmic man, as indicated by the red arrows, has a blue pigment that unnaturally streams halfway across the panel. We can take a closer look at the mask of the cosmic man. Note he has one eye on the left side of his face, and the right is the beak of an eagle. The impression of a nose is below the mask, and what appears to be a mouth and teeth can be found above a dropped chin. When we turn our heads 90 degrees sideways, 
the teacher and the fledging golden eagle transform into the mask of the cosmic man. See how the artist used the juvenile eagle to form the beak of the cosmic man's mask. The artist is telling us that the bird and the man are separate, but can also become the same. On this panel, we find a speckled mare. She is agitated and appears to be leaping with her head turned as if something is on her back. Our cosmic man may be what has agitated the speckled mare. He emerges with her in the same tradition as the avianoid horse on the Agnes Day panel at the Grotte de Pere non -Pere. The horse gives him supernatural abilities. We encounter another transformation, where a mask is put on to become an avianoid. Note our avianoid's left hand is feathered and behind his back. This is also the feathered left hand of the cosmic man. They are the same character. The terrestrial pareidolia and astronomy elements to these gallery of discs images can be found in my 2023 European Association of Archaeologists presentation, Sacred Landscapes in Rock Art, on YouTube, academia.edu, and ResearchGate. The Grat de Pere non Pere avianoid and horse also directly derive from the same source. Pillar 43 at Gobekli Tepe may indirectly derive from this source. Pillar 43 is obviously missing the horse, making the relationship uncertain. Let us now travel south to Gorham's Cave at Gibraltar to view Gorham's etching, which is contemporaneous with the gallery of discs. Two images were taken of what I call Gorham's etching. We will work with the cleaned-off image. Gorham's etching has been widely described as abstract art of Neanderthals. Viewers can make their own decision as to the authorship at the end of this presentation. A pictorial summary of the initial study findings can be found in this so-called hashtag image. We can take a few steps further by comparing Gorham's etching with the horizontal and vertical lines on the nearby Mulasen, which is the highest peak on the Iberian Peninsula. Note the natural irregularity in the mountain that the Gorham's etching artist captured. This section of Mulasen has the look of an agitated horse. We are looking at pareidolia and, at the same time, viewing a physical source for Gorham's etching. To the viewers upper left on Gorham's etching, there are a teacher wearing a mask and his listening apprentice. The mask of the teacher has the appearance of a kite. The scene echoes the spiritual leader of the gallery of discs, who appears in the ear of the wide-eyed apprentice. Both have a bluish tint. Like the gallery of discs teacher, the Gorm's etching teacher's spiritual leader draws strength from other animal beings. We can see a mother bear with her golden juvenile extending from his right shoulder. A wolf extends from his left shoulder. Note the right foreleg and clawed paw. Both the bear and wolf give strengths to mediate other realms. This incredible portrayal evidences the inherent depths of the human imagination. We have found some answers in our search for what it means to be human among these representations of mediating the real and imaginary. In traditions that can be traced with avianoids to more than 34,000 years ago. These avianoid traditions, which continued past the edge of the Upper Paleolithic at Gobekli Tepe, traditions inherited by indigenous peoples since time immemorial and scribed by the ancients whose great works many still look to for guidance. We today live in an age of great rediscovery. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak at this year's European Association of Archaeologists annual meeting. More of my work can be found on these sites. I'm always open to cooperate on projects and virtually present my research to community and academic audiences. A pre-recording of this presentation will be posted to my webpage and the images would text to academia.edu and ResearchGate.